So my name is Jamie Lisa, and I am the Outreach Librarian here at the William H. Hannon Library. And I want to thank all of you for coming out to celebrate the opening of Manifold Greatness with us tonight. This is the culmination of nearly two years worth of work and waiting, and I'm delighted that this day is finally here. Um, we were one of 40 academic and public libraries that were selected across the country to host the traveling exhibition of Manifold Greatness. Um, it was created to celebrate the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible in 2011, and it was organized by the Folger Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and the American Library Association's Public Programs Office. It's based on an exhibition of the same name developed by the Folger Shakespeare Library and the Bodleian Library at the University of Oxford, with assistance from the Harry Ransom Center for the University of Texas. Um, this exhibition was also made possible by a major grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. So after tonight's talk, um, all are invited to join us in the atrium to view the exhibition, along with the companion exhibit um, of rare books in Archives and Special Collections, which is called um, um, Singular Wisdom, the King James Bible and Early Printed Bibles. And then copies of Dr. Ehrman's books are also going to be available for sale and signing. Um, if you enjoy yourself tonight, I do want to encourage you to help us spread the word and consider attending one of the other three events that we have planned over the next month um, and that you see briefly described um, behind me. We also have these available for you to take with you. Um, it's taken an army of collaborators and partners to make this happen, and I need to extend my sincere gratitude to the following supporters. Um, so my colleagues here at the library, the LMU Office of the Provost, the Office of the Associate Provost for Undergraduate Education, the Department of Theological Studies, Young Presidential Associates, the Center for Religion and Spirituality, Campus Ministry, the William Andrews Clark Library at UCLA, and the Inglewood Public Library. And finally, I need to thank my guide to all things New Testament, who did not know what he was getting into when he picked up the phone back in March 2011 when I called to ask him for advice. Otherwise, I'm pretty sure he would have just left, let it go to voicemail. Um, and conveniently forgotten about it. So please join me in thanking and welcoming LME Theological Studies Professor Jeffrey Seiker, who will introduce tonight's speaker. There we go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Um, uh, I didn't answer the first time she called. Uh, or actually the second, then I got an email that said she wasn't going to let up, so I, I said, all right. Um, uh, it's a real honor to be able to introduce Bart Ehrman. Uh, Bart and I go back uh, longer than I'd care to think. We were both uh, students of Princeton Theological Seminary together doing our PhDs. He was a few years ahead of me, and I'll never forget the first time I met him, uh, I walked into the graduate study office where everybody, every graduate student basically built a small castle uh, on a desk where their stuff was. And Bart, this is before the age of computers, uh, Bart had all of these three by five index cards because he was collating manuscripts from uh, a guy by the name of Didymus the Blind. And um, I remember asking Bart, so what does it mean to look at manuscripts by a guy who was blind? You know, and he said, good question. And he never really answered it. But, um, <laughs> so we've been, we've been talking ever since. Uh, at any rate, let me give you the, the formal spiel on Professor Ehrman. There might be some editorializing, you can never tell. Um, uh, Bart Ehrman is the James A. Gray Distinguished Professor at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. Um, he's been at UNC since 1988, uh, after four years of teaching at Rutgers. And at the University of North Carolina, he has served as the Director of Graduate Studies, he chaired the department, he has won distinguished teaching awards there. He received his uh, Master's of Divinity and PhD from Princeton Theological Seminary uh, following his BA from Wheaton College. And um, he worked with uh, the person who was clearly, was clearly the preeminent uh, textual critical scholar in the United States at least, uh, Professor Bruce Metzger, who was uh, a wonderful, wonderful human being and I imagine Bart may have some stories he wants to share. Um, but uh, since uh, finishing at Princeton, uh, Bart has net let no dust settle under his pen. He is the author uh, or editor of 24 books, and I think by the end of this year it's gonna rise to 28, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
tons of articles, dozens of book reviews. He's just incredibly prolific, and uh, the rest of the guild is rather jealous and envious. Um, many of the books that he's written have been on the New York Times bestseller list, which is why he's made it on the Colbert Report a couple of times, and on the John Stewart Daily Show once, and I don't think uh, any of the more conservative places have invited you yet, but, <laughs> um, but it is true that Bart has engaged in all kinds of public debates with relatively conservative theological voices across the country, um, since his own roots lie in a more conservative tradition. Among his most recent books are the Greek-English edition of the Apostolic Fathers, uh, in the Low Classical Library series, so it is kind of the go-to volume for the Apostolic Fathers. Um, also, he's published an assessment of the newly discovered Gospel of Judas with Oxford University Press, and then four New York Times bestseller books, Jesus Interrupted, God's Problem, looking at the view of, of suffering, misquoting Jesus, um, which is probably the most surprising book that made it on the New York Times bestseller list. And I think it made it to number three, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and it's on text criticism, of all things, which is uh, not the sexiest subject uh, on the face of the planet, typically, but Bart managed to, to pull it off. And then most recently, Forged, which looks at why some books in the New Testament are, in fact, deliberate forgeries. Uh, his books have been translated into 27 languages, and uh, I asked him if Algonquin had been one of them. Uh, Algonquin was apparently the first Bible published in the United States. Um, Bart and I were wondering how many Algonquins actually read it. Um, at any rate, among Bart's fields of uh, scholarly expertise are the historical Jesus, early Christian Apocrypha, Apostolic Fathers, uh, manuscript tradition of the New Testament, and I should also add uh, the history of the reception of the New Testament text. Um, Bart is a, a text critic and has been busy working on the task of reestablishing or establishing as best we can the most original version of the New Testament but he's also been very influential at pushing the guild of text critics beyond simply the New Testament into looking at, all right, well, what were the texts that the early church fathers used? What were the texts that these other people used? Um, and so very much looking at regional and local texts that various folks have used. Um, he has served as president of the Southeast region of the Society of Biblical Literature. He's chaired the New Testament textual criticism section of the society has served as a book review editor for the main uh, academic journal, the Journal of Biblical Literature, and he has been the editor of the monograph series on the New Testament and the Greek Fathers. He currently serves as co-editor of the international, uh, of the series New Testament Tools, Studies, and Documents, and he's co-editor in chief for an international journal, Vigiliae Christianae, which is one of the main journals that looks at early Christianity. And he has uh, served on a bunch of other editorial boards and journals and monographs in the field. Um, he lectures extensively. He, won, he has won numerous university awards and grants, including the 2009 Pope Spirit of Inquiry Teaching Award, the 1993 UNC Undergraduate Student Teaching Award, the 94 Prize for Artistic and Scholarly Achievement, and the Bowman and Gordon Gray Award for Excellence in Teaching. Bart also has um, done several of the uh, tape series on, what, what's it called again, tell me? Uh, teaching Company. The Teaching Company, yes. And so you, you may have seen the Teaching Company series that he's done <coughs> on the New Testament, among other things. Um, and he's, he's just a, a really brilliant lecturer. He's able to write in ways that people can access and understand what he's talking about, even if he's talking about complicated things. Uh, Bart uh, has two kids. Uh, uh, Kelly and Derek, who are both now in their 30s, which is scarier than anything. And uh, he's married to uh, Sarah, uh, who is a professor of theater and medieval English at Duke University. And they make their home in Durham, North Carolina. And we were very pleased to be able to, today, able to get him out here. So please join me in welcoming uh, Bart Ehrman. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. And, uh, thank, thank you all for, uh, for coming out uh, tonight. I've uh, enjoyed uh, being here so far and uh, enjoyed uh, preparing this lecture uh, on the King James Bible, uh, something that is a, uh, obviously a, a, an enormous cultural artifact and uh, is worth uh, our attention and this uh, exhibition that you have uh, here at LMU. Uh, 
So uh, my talk is what kind of text is the King James Bible, manuscript translation, and the legacy of the King James Version. I want to start by talking about a, a very brief history of Bible translation. Uh, and uh, to begin that, to talk about my first uh, interest in uh, Bible translation. Uh, about 25 years ago, before I started teaching at Chapel Hill, I uh, was working for my mentor, Bruce Metzger, who, uh, as Jeff said, is one of the great textual scholars uh, of the 20th century. And he, among other things, was the chairman of the committee uh, that was pre preparing the new Revised Standard Version of the, of the Bible, which is a standard translation that, that a lot of people use today. And uh, when, I, when I graduated from my PhD program with him, he asked me if I would serve as his research assistant for the NRSD translation. And so I did research for uh, a couple of years with Metzger uh, in preparation for this translation that was coming out. In the, the office that I had uh, there at Princeton Seminary, the library, Spear Library at Princeton Seminary, while working for the NRSV, there was a, uh, a, a metal box that was sitting on the bookshelf that Metzger loved to show people and tell about. Inside this box were ashes. And uh, the deal was this. Uh, in 1952, the revised standard version of the Bible was published. And many conservative Christians thought that it was filled with heresy because they had mistranslated important passages. And that this translation, the RSV, was in fact inspired by the devil. And so there was a pastor in North Carolina, where I now live, uh, who, uh, who took a copy of the RSV in the pulpit and took a blowtorch and, pub and announced this to the pub publicly before he did this, so, so he'd get a big crowd, and he, he, he attacked it with the blowtorch. And as it, it as it turns out, it's hard to get a Bible to burn. <laughs> uh, not because it's a Bible, but just because it's a book with hard covers. And it's, it's hard to get. And so he had this blowtorch going, and it wasn't working. And he, he finally says, well, it's like the devil. It's hard to burn. <laughs> and so finally, the thing caught fire, and it burned. And he collected the ashes, and he sent them to the chair of the RSV Bible <laughs> Translation Committee, saying, this is what I think of your Bible. So Mester would always show off this, this, uh, this box of ashes, and then he would say that he's glad that in the modern period uh, that uh, it's only a copy of the translation that gets burned rather than the translator, <laughs> since, since he was the translator for the RSV. So uh, yes, yeah, so in the modern uh, in the modern period, uh, sometimes people burn translations, but uh, in fact, uh, at one point, they did burn translators. The first translator of the Bible into English was William Tyndale. And uh, he was, in fact, burned at the stake for his efforts. He wasn't the first to translate the Bible into English per se. The first to do this was John Wycliffe, or at least the followers of John Wycliffe in 1382. And you're going to have, there's, there's going to be another session devoted to the Wycliffeite uh, Bible here as part of, part of the series that, was, that I'm sure will be extremely interesting. Wycliffe translated the Latin Bible into English. And so the deal is this. The, uh, the Christian Old Testament, the, the Jewish Bible, is written in Hebrew, and the New Testament is written in Greek. But throughout the history of, of the Western church, the Bible that people used was the Latin translation that had been done back in the fourth century, starting with, with, the, uh, with, with the great scholar Jerome. And so the Roman Catholic Church historically had used the Latin Bible. So Wycliffe, or at least his followers, translated the Latin Bible into English in the 14th century, uh, 1382. And this caused uh, a lot of, uh, of Roman Catholics to be upset. A lot of Roman Catholic uh, clerics didn't want the Bible available to people in their native language because they weren't sure what use they would put the Bible to. And so they wanted to be able to tell them what was in the Bible and what the Bible meant without people reading it for themselves. And so they got upset about this Wycliffe Bible. And there was a, uh, a convention in Oxford in 1408, in, uh, obviously in England, where there was a, uh, a policy passed that said that nobody could translate the Bible into English anymore without, getting, uh, without being authorized by the church so that they wouldn't allow Bible translation. 
Uh, and this became, uh, this became the law of the land in England in the early 15th century. When Tyndale came along in the early 16th century, he decided that, in fact, he wanted the Bible available to, uh, to people, uh, that he didn't want it simply to be available to the clergy. He wanted people to be able to read it. And he wanted them to read a translation that was made from the original Hebrew and Greek, not simply from the Latin Vulgate. Uh, he was uh, trained in Greek, as most people were at that time, starting, starting soon before that at Oxford. Uh, so he could read Greek well, and he picked up Hebrew as well, and so he started translating the Bible. He translated the entire New Testament, and uh, in the process of doing this, he knew he wouldn't be welcomed in England, so he actually had to go over to Germany to do it. Uh, and he translated the New Testament. He ended up being betrayed and thrown in jail. Uh, he translated the first five books of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, and in jail, he translated Joshua to Second Chronicles. So he translated about half of the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but he ended up, uh, as I said, being betrayed. He was in jail. They ended, up, they ended up executing him for violating this law of 1408. And so he was burned at the stake uh, in uh, 1536. And so uh, that was, that's what happened to the first <laughs> Bible translator, William Tyndale. <laughs> uh, after Tyndale, uh, what a, a lot of people don't realize is that the King James Version was not the first English translation, Tyndale's was, and it wasn't the first one after Tyndale. There were a number of translations that were done. There were, there were seven major translations after Tyndale, but the, the most important ones were one by a companion of his, Miles Coverdale, who did a translation in 1535 that was, if, in fact, accepted in England, uh, even though uh, Tyndale ended up being executed the next year for doing exactly the same thing. Uh, the Great Bible, that was also done by this guy, uh, Miles Coverdale. Uh, and these are both, these are entire Bibles. So Tyndale didn't get through the entire Bible because he got killed first, but, but uh, these are entire Bibles. The Great Bible is called the Great Bible not because everybody thought it was so great, but because it was enormous. Uh, and so uh, it was designed for churches. So you'd have a big Bible up there in church so people, people could read it. There's a Bible called the Geneva Bible in 1560, which was a, uh, it's called the Geneva Bible because uh, Protestants who were in exile from England had gone to Geneva and they decided they wanted a, uh, to do a new translation of the Bible. And they did this translation uh, in which they put a lot of marginal notes where they lambasted the Catholic Church. Uh, these were Protestants who really didn't like the Catholic Church and among other things, they had marginal notes that indicated that the uh, Roman Catholic Pope was the Antichrist of 666 of the Book of Revelation and, uh, and other things that didn't make them very popular with their Catholic friends and neighbors. Uh, finally, there was a bishop's Bible done in 1568 uh, by a group, of, uh, a group of bishops. These two Bibles here, the, uh, the Geneva Bible and the Bishop's Bible, were the first Bibles done by committee. Today, almost all Bible translations are done by committee. Uh, and there are, there are different opinions about that, about whether that's a good thing or not. Uh, some people think that uh, really what you, what a better thing is to have somebody's individual genius come through uh, in a translation. And other people think that it's better to have a committee because that way you can sort of get rid of the idiosyncrasies of any particular translator. Uh, but you know, sometimes translation by committee doesn't go so well because it's like writing a memo by committee. It's you get the kind of the lowest common denominator. It's not so great. Well, the thing about all of these Bibles is that even though they're separate translations, all of them were heavily dependent on Tyndale's translation. And that, of course, is, not of course, that, that is what we're going to see with the King James Bible as well. So let me say something about where the King James Bible came from. King James became the king of England uh, in the early uh, 17th century. Uh, he had been the king of Scotland, uh, and he was, uh, he was related uh, by blood to uh, Queen Elizabeth, and he became uh, the king. And uh, one of the big problems that Elizabeth had faced during her reign was that the, uh, the Puritans in the English church uh, didn't like very well the established church. Uh, that they thought that the established church with its bishops, 
and its ceremonies and its rituals were not really what religion was supposed to be all about. And so Puritans were sort of like really hyper-Protestants. And in the Church of England, you also had people who were very traditional. And the Puritans and the traditionalists were at each other's throats. And so uh, King James, who was concerned about such things, called a conference at, uh, at a palace at Hampton Court, which is just uh, outside of London, in the south, uh, southwest side of London. Uh, it, was a, it was a palace built by Henry VIII. And uh, he had this Hampton Court conference in order to have the Puritans and the traditionalists figure out how to get along with each other. Well, so they had these debates, and it didn't go too well for the Puritans. But, but, at, the end, but at the end of these debates, somebody suggest, said, one of the Puritans suggested, we need a new translation of the Bible. They wanted a new translation of the Bible because they didn't like the bishop's Bible that had been around. Uh, Henry, Henry, uh, I'm sorry, but James was actually on the side of the, of the traditionalists. And he liked the idea of a new translation because he thought if we get a new translation, he could, he could quiet these Puritans, who are the ones who wanted the translation. <laughs> and so he agreed to the new translation, uh, but thinking that this would be a way of promoting the cause of the traditionalists. And so there were, uh, he, he made it happen. There were six committees appointed. Mainly these were people who taught at Oxford and Cambridge, the two universities in England at the time. Uh, they formed six committees, two of which met at Oxford, Cambridge, and then in London at Westminster. Um, there, there are questions among scholars about how many people actually participated in the translation, but the best guess is that there were 47 uh, translators who were all skilled, highly skilled, in, uh, in Greek and Hebrew. Today, when somebody's highly skilled in Greek, uh, like Jeff Seiker and me, we're, we're considered highly skilled in Greek. That means we can kind of slosh our way through a Greek text if we have a good dictionary sitting next to us. <laughs> These guys, including King James, could speak Greek and did speak Greek to each other when they felt like it. Uh, and they could read Hebrew like the newspaper. So, I mean, this is, th these were serious, uh, serious scholars who, uh, you know, their excuses, they didn't have TV. Uh, <laughs> there, there was no ESPN. Uh, they, uh, you know, the, what did they do? They sit around and they studied Greek. I mean, this is what they did. And so they were, and Latin and Hebrew and what. They had six committees uh, in, these, in these places, and they started the translation. All of the people on these committees were church people. Uh, they were either Pur Puritans or, uh, or uh, Many of them were bishops or had some kind, had some kind of connection, official connection with the church. Uh, it took them seven years. It was finished in 16, uh, 1611. It was called the Authorized Version. In America, we call it the King James Bible. In England, they call it the Authorized Version, although authorized is a bit of a misnomer because the, uh, King, the King, King James never really officially authorized the translation. And it was never authorized by an act of parliament or anything else. But, but uh, the people who translated it uh, considered it to be authorized. And so they, they call it the authorized version. Uh, one of the striking things about this authorized version, the King James Version, is just how much it is reliant on earlier translations, especially the translation of Tyndale. This reliance, in fact, is admitted by the translators. In the preface of the 1611 edition of the King James Bible, uh, it says, truly good Christian reader, we never thought, this is the translators talking, from the beginning that we should need to make a new translation, but to make a good translation better. Or out of many good ones, make one principal good one. That hath been our endeavor. And so they're admitting that they're not, in fact, um, ignoring what the other translations have, have done. They're going to consult those as well as look at the Hebrew and the Greek. What they don't tell you is that they basically ripped off the Tyndale translation. <laughs> uh, so the reality is that the King James Version is a, uh, is a, re it's a re technically, it's a revision of the Bishop's Bible. The Bishop's Bible was a revision of the Great Bible, and the Great Bible was a revision of Tyndale. <laughs> In the exhibit out here, uh, in, the, in the exhibit in the room in here where they've got the, the Bibles and things, one of, the, one of the very telling exhibits is they have uh, a passage from Matthew chapter 5 in the Tyndale Bible, 
in the Geneva Bible and, and in the King James Bible. Just look at them and see how similar they are. The best guesstimates are that the King James Bible in the New Testament reproduces Tyndale's words in 92% of the, of the cases. 92% of the words are simply taken from Tyndale. So, uh, you know, people celebrate the King James as being the greatest, uh, and it is. I mean, I, I will go on to say it is the great classic of American literature, American, of, <laughs> of, English, of English literature. It's a great classic of English literature, but the genius goes back to Tyndale. Uh, and this isn't uh, often enough uh, acknowledged by people who celebrate the King James, not realizing that, in fact, these translators had predecessors. I should say, by the way, that most of the Bibles that are used today, not, not most of the Bibles, the, the new Revised Standard Version that, that, I, that I did research for was a revision of the 1952 Revised Standard Version that the guy took the blowtorch to. The Revised Standard Version was a revision of the 1901 American Standard Version, which was a revision of the 1881 Revised Version, which was a revision of the King James. <laughs> Which is a revision of Tyndale. It all goes back to Tyndale. When they were, when they were doing the NRSD, by the way, uh, one, one of the things people don't recognize is how, how do you come up with a name for a new translation? Uh, and so when I sat in on the committee meetings for the NRSV, they debated, what are we going to call this thing? They ended up calling it the NRSV, but there were other options. Uh, the one that I really hoped they would go for, that I thought they were going to go for, is that since it was the translation, it was a revision of the RSV, I, I was hoping they would go with the RSVP. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't, didn't do it. They didn't suggest it, though. Uh, all right, so uh, let me talk about the King James Version and uh, the many virtues of the King James Version. And there are indeed uh, many virtues of the King James uh, Bible. For one thing, there are very, very memorable passages uh, passages that people who know uh, their Bibles, these passages, they just sound right. They sound like the Bible. Uh, let me give you some examples. Genesis chapter 1. This is from the King James. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said... Let there be light, and there was light. You know, you can argue that nobody's done it better than that. That is, that is very good. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. And so on. Very familiar, very uh, moving and powerful. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 to 5. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Uh, move into the New Testament. For example, the passage that's in the, uh, in the room over here, the Beatitudes from the Gospel of Matthew. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And the last example, the Gospel of John, chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. 
well, these are, uh, these are very uh, powerful ways of phrasing the biblical text. They're direct. They are rhetorically effective. They, uh, the, the schemes of, uh, the, the scanning schemes work very well. Uh, they're just uh, very moving and powerful. So there, uh, you know, the, the King James is, for this reason, has been one of the great classics of the English language that people should read for the sake of the language, I think. There are not only uh, memorable uh, passages in the King James, there are, uh, there are memorable phrases, phrases that have become virtually common phrases in the English language. Genesis 4, am I my brother's keeper? Matthew 5, the salt of the earth. Matthew 18, where two or three are gathered together. Matthew 26, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Luke 12, my favorite, eat, drink, and be merry. <laughs> Romans 2, a law unto themselves. Romans 13, the powers that be. James 5, the patience of Job. Phrase after phrase of the King James have, have, have come into the, the English language and are phrases that we now use in completely different context just because they're such memorable, memorable phrases. The impact on the English language has been enormous. Many people argue that Shakespeare uh, is the most influential individual on the English language, and I think that that's probably right. If you, if you look at the number of words that Shakespeare introduced into the English language, it's some phenomenal number, and, and there's no doubt that Shakespeare has had probably the largest impact on the English language. But I would argue that William Tyndale is a close second because the King James Bible has made such an enormous impact on the English language and the way we speak the language, the way we understand the language, and it's getting a lot of these words from Tyndale. So in some respects, uh, it's Tyndale who's made the impact, but it's directly through the King James Bible. And so there is, uh, there is no doubt that the King James Bible is one of the great literary productions of Western civilization. So uh, I, I think that is an absolute certainty. That's not to say that the King James Bible is without its problems. There are people today who think that the King James Bible is the only acceptable translation of the Bible. Now, most of the people who feel that way know nothing about the actual history of how the book was put together. And uh, I would suggest that people who think that really should read up on the history of the King James Bible to see how it was put together. And one of the books on uh, display out here for sale that uh, I did not write, uh, but I have read, uh, is uh, called, is by the same name, Manifold Greatness. And it's, it's a great little introduction to how the King James Bible came about. That would be worth reading if you want to see how the King James Bible was, was put together. There are problems with the King James Bible, I think, in terms of its usability today by people who want to know what the biblical authors actually said. Now, that's a different issue from, do you want to read a great English classic? If you want to read a great, Eng great English classic, the King James Bible is the translation to read. But if you want to know what the biblical authors actually said, the King James Bible has some problems, and I want to, to detail what some of these problems are. There are actually uh, three major problems that I'll talk about. One is changes in the English language since 1611 because the language has changed. Uh, most, of, uh, most of you who are older realize that English has changed a lot in your lifetime, uh, you know, when, uh, <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> as we, we learn from our students all the time. <laughs> so when I started teaching, uh, never mind, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Second, uh, the theological biases of the translators sometimes affected the way they translated the, the Bible. Uh, I'll, I'll give instance of all, of all three of these. And third, the textual basis of the translation is a problem. So I'll talk about all three of these. First, I'll start with changes <coughs> in the English language since 1611. As it turns out, uh, there have been a lot of changes over these 400 years. There are words found in the King James Bible that we simply don't use anymore. Here are some examples. 
Almug, Album, Charsheen, Chode, Cracknels. These are in the King James Bible. <laughs> Gat, Hagergion, Hosen, Gap, Leaguer, Neist, Noosings, Ouches, Ringstrike, Sycamine, Trow, and Wimples. Uh, there are a lot more. And I bet you don't know what these words mean. <laughs> what, is, what does Almug mean? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I think you put it in an apple pie, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but King James has uh, interesting choices about which animals they name. Okay, so, so the problem with animals in the Bible, Bible translators sometimes don't know how to translate certain words. I mean, modern, today, even 400 years later, we don't know how to translate some words in the Bible. Because you know it's talking about some kind of four-legged creature, and that's all you know. So what... What do you call it? Well, the King James, uh, you know, so in the King James, you've got unicorns and satyrs and dragons and cockatrices and arrow snakes. Uh, the first four are legendary creatures, and the fifth doesn't exist. <laughs> it's not even a legendary creature. Nobody knows what it is. So, uh, so uh, yeah, modern translations uh, don't use those. Uh, so, well, that's a problem if you're reading a passage and it's using one of these words, you know, so uh, that's a problem. Some phrases in the King James Bible no longer make sense. <laughs> Ouches of gold. Collops of fat. Naughty figs. <laughs> Lean with, lean with, I guess. The ground is chapped. A brazen wall. Rentest thy face and murine of the cattle. So uh, you get words, you get phrases. You get sentences that simply don't work in English anymore. <laughs> and Jacob sawed pottage. Uh, I think that means he was cooking uh, stew. Uh, and Mount Sinai was altogether on a smoke. <laughs> that sounds illegal. <laughs> Thou shalt destroy them that speak leasing. Which sounds like something a real estate agent would be doing. Uh, we do you to wit of the grace of God. My favorite is this one. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound good. <laughs> he who let it will let. And then this incomprehensible, the words of the wise are as goads and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, this morning, I looked this up in some other Bible translations, Ecclesiastes 12. And they don't make sense either. <laughs> this, is, this is one of those verses that probably doesn't make sense in Hebrew. So, uh, but in any case, the, that, uh, it's impossible to know what they're talking about in the King James. Uh, sometimes sentences do make sense uh, that have been changed. In <laughs> I will cut off from Jeroboam him that pisseth against the wall. I looked this one up in Hebrew, and you know, it's exactly what the Hebrew says. <laughs> I will cut from Jeroboam, meaning the region of Jeroboam, I will cut off, I will kill anyone that urinates against the wall. That's what it says. Uh, but what it, so what it means is uh, a man as opposed to a woman. And in King James' time, they understood because men were still pissing against walls <laughs> as part of kind of what they did during the day. So, uh, <laughs> so the uh, modern translations have uh, normally changed this uh, to uh, male. <laughs> as opposed to female. Uh, there are other changes in the language that are a little bit different from the ones I've been talking about. What I've been talking about so far have been changes that you don't know what the word really means. Well, the bigger problem is there are times when words in 1611 meant something different from what they mean today. And when you read the passage, you think you know what it means because the words make sense, but they make the wrong sense. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? Because the word, the meaning of the word has changed. Okay, see what I mean? So, uh, for example, uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, uh, in my 20s, I heard somebody preach a sermon. I was in a church and somebody preached a sermon on Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven. And the sermon was about how you shouldn't tell dirty jokes because your conversation is to be in heaven. And so you're not to, you know, you're not to use foul language, you're not to curse, your, your conversation is to be in heaven, which made sense from the King James. But it's not what it means. The word conversation in uh, 
in this, the 17th century is what we would use for the word something like citizenship. Mm -hmm. Your citizenship is in heaven. I mean, it's, maybe it still means you shouldn't tell bad joke, bad foul joke, but, but it's not what it meant. So, I mean, so uh, Revelation 17 says, this is, this is one of my favorites. So Re Revelation chapter 17, you know, Revelation is about this, the, this prophet who has these visions, these bizarre, weird, scary visions. And in 17, he has one of the most bizarre. He sees a woman who in the King James is called the whore of Babylon. The whore of Babylon is in a wilderness. She's seated on a beast. This beast has seven heads and ten horns. And she's holding a cup in her hand that's filled with her abominations of her fornication. And she is drunk with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. It's this horrifying sight. And after he looked at her, he says, I saw her and I wondered with great admiration. <laughs> well, admiration in the 17th century meant astonishment or amazement. You know, he wasn't admiring her. <laughs> it sort of cuts against the point of the passage. Well, so uh, some of these others. Uh, 2 Kings 11, 1, Solomon loved many strange women. <laughs> they may have been strange, but what it means is they were foreign. They mean non-Israelite women is what it means. Um, Leviticus 14.10, the meat offering in Leviticus 10, uh, 14 is actually talking about the offering of grains, wheat and such. But, you know, calling it meat sort of changes the point. Uh, and so too with uh, 1 Samuel 17, where Goliath carried a target on his shoulder. Uh, it means javelin. He's carrying a javelin on his shoulder. Uh, Psalm 88, in the morning shall my prayer prevent thee. <laughs> right. It means come before you, shall come before you. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.4, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. <laughs> <laughs> Which means well-being. Uh, it doesn't mean you're supposed to go out and covet his money, uh, his well-being. In Acts chapter 10, the apostle Peter sees a sheet that is lowered from heaven that's filled with animals. And in the King James, it says that the sheet is knit at the four corners. And knit means to be let down. So it's not that it's a sheet that has knit, you know, knitting at the corners. It's, it's being let down. And Philippians 4, 6, be careful for nothing, <laughs> doesn't mean to be careless. Uh, it means don't worry about anything. Okay, so, uh, so in the sense of don't care. Don't be full of care. But don't worry about anything. So anyway, so... Yeah, there are hundreds of these that you can come up with. And the problem with these, as I said, is that you read them, and they seem to make sense, but uh, they mean they have a different sense from the way you would take them today. And so this, it's a problem if, you, if what you want to do is know what the authors meant. All right, so the other two problems in the text are the theological biases of the translators and the textual basis of the translation. So uh, let me say something about the theological biases of the, uh, of the translators that sometimes get in the way, got in the way of the translation, uh, in, in my opinion. I'll give you just two examples of this. Daniel chapter 325. Daniel 3 is this famous story about uh, these three uh, Israelite men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to worship a statue of the king, Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will not worship the statue because they're faithful to God. And uh, they're not going to worship anything, anyone except for God. But there's a law of the land that if anyone doesn't worship the statue of, Shadrach, uh, of, the, of Nebuchadnezzar, they'll be thrown into a fiery furnace. And so they refuse. Nebuchadnezzar gets ticked off. And he has the furnace heated up to seven times its normal heat. They take uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they, they bind them. They throw them in the furnace. And the furnace is so hot that it kills the people who throw them in. But then Nebuchadnezzar looks in the furnace, and he sees there's a fourth figure in there. And the King James says that he sees walking with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego the Son of God. Now, of course, any Christian reader is going to read that and assume that it, Jesus is in there with them. But the Hebrew doesn't actually say the Son of God. It's, it's not Hebrew, it's Aramaic at this point. It says, a son of the gods, meaning some kind of angelic being. But it's not talking about the Son of God, Jesus. 
this is importing Jesus into the, the Old Testament, you know, which, is a, which is a theological move. So you might want to interpret it that it's really Jesus in there, but it's not what the text says. Okay? So you, you see what I mean? It's, it's kind of subtle, but it, it, it ends up mattering. An even more uh, important case is in the book of Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. So uh, this takes a little bit longer to unpack. So <laughs> the deal is this. Uh, Isaiah was a, uh, a man living in the 8th century BCE who was a prophet who was a kind of advisor to the king Ahab. Ahab? Ahaz. Who knows? <laughs> Depends what part of you read. Uh, king Ahab. And Ahab is upset because two foreign countries have attacked him. The northern country of Israel and the country of Syria have attacked Judah and have laid siege to Jerusalem. And Isaiah tells the king that he doesn't need to worry about these two kings that have attacked him because God's going to take care of the situation. And the king says, how will I know? And Isaiah says that God will give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel. That's how it's, that's the King James translation of it. And then he goes on to say, before the child is, old, is, very, is very old, he'll be able to eat honey and curds, and these two kingdoms will go back and not bother you anymore. Now, the point of this passage is that some woman's going to get pregnant or is pregnant already and is going to give birth, and before the child gets very old, the problem will pass away. Okay? But in the King James translation, it's translated, a virgin shall conceive. That gets quoted in the New Testament by the Gospel of Matthew as a reference to Jesus. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call him Emmanuel. In the book of Matthew, in the New Testament, quoting Isaiah chapter 7. Now, this is complicated, but when Matthew is quoting Isaiah, he's not quoting the Hebrew of Isaiah. He's quoting the ancient Greek translation of Isaiah, which does use the word virgin. But the Hebrew Bible, that is the base for the Greek translation and for the King James Version, doesn't say virgin. In the Hebrew Bible, it says a young woman has conceived and will bear a son. The Hebrew word is alma. A young woman. It's not Bethula, which means a virgin. And so there's nothing in this passage about the woman being a virgin. <coughs> She's a young woman. And that makes perfect sense in the context of Isaiah. A young woman will conceive or has conceived, and by the time her son is old enough, these kingdoms are, these kings are going to be disappear. Well, the King James translators are being influenced by their knowledge of the quotation of this passage in Matthew and by their belief that Jesus was born of a virgin, and so they put it back onto Isaiah, even though it wasn't originally there. See what I mean? So it's a, it's, a, it's a bias of the translator that's affecting the translation. And so in most modern translations today, Isaiah 7.14 will be translated, a young woman will conceive, or has conceived, and will bear a son. Uh, whereas in Matthew, of course, it's translated virgin because that's the word that's used there. All right, so, uh, so anyway, so that's, that's a case where you're not really seeing what Isaiah had to say because the, the translator's bias has gotten in the way. Finally, the textual basis of the translation. This is the third problem. I'll just do these, uh, just mention these problems that tend to be in the New Testament. And j just to give you the brief, the brief story of this, which is, since 1611, a lot of manuscripts have been discovered of the New Testament, Greek manuscripts. Uh, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. It was copied in Greek, and copies of those copies were copied over the, over the years, over the centuries. Today, we have something like 5,600 copies of the New Testament in Greek. The King James translation was based on like eight or 10. And the eight or 10 they used weren't very good. 
Now, it's all they had available to them. But since then, we've discovered thousands. But it means that we know more what the original text said because of these thousands, they're all different from each other. They have different <coughs> wording here and there in the other place. And these few that were available to the King James translators were not very, very early. They were ancient. I mean, they, they, were, they were not very ancient. And in some places, they, were, they, were, they had mistakes in them from copies making mistakes. This led to, to a lot of problems. Here's one of the key ones. Um, 1 John chapter 5, verses 7 and 8. This is, this is called the Johannine comma. Uh, I don't know why they call it. So uh, a, a Johannine, because it's in the, first John, the book of 1 John, comma means just a phrase, a short phrase, or, or a part of a sentence. And so this is an important passage because it's the only passage in the New Testament that explicitly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, it's the only passage in the New Testament that explicitly affirms the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, th there are passages that mention Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but this passage actually states the doctrine itself, as I will uh, read to you from the King James. 1 John 5. So, uh, King James, 1 John 5, verses 7 and 8. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Okay, there you got it. Three that bear witness. There are three divine beings, but there's only one. Three persons, one Godhead, that's the Trinity. So that's, that's how the King James translates that, that verse. Now, when the King James translators were translating their New Testament, they were not actually looking at the manuscripts themselves, these eight or 10 manuscripts. They were looking at a book that had printed the New Testament based on these few manuscripts. The book was, was produced by the, uh, by the great scholar named Erasmus, who was a, a, a scholar who uh, produced editions of books based on the ancient Greek. Erasmus was the first to publish a Greek New Testament in printed form. Over the centuries, people had copied them by hand. Printing was invented in the 15th century. Erasmus was the first to produce a printed Greek New Testament. And in his printed Greek New Testament, he didn't have that verse. They had the Trinity in it. And the reason was because the manuscript he used for 1 John didn't have the verse in it. Well. Uh, so what happened, what happened was Erasmus's translate uh, version didn't have it, and people got really upset because they said, you took out the Trinity. <laughs> and uh, Erasmus said, I didn't take out the Trinity. It wasn't in my Greek manuscript. And he said, I looked at other Greek manuscripts. They don't have it either. But it was in the Latin Vulgate. It was in the Latin. And so they said, but it's, you know, it should be in there. And Erasmus apparently said, if you can find me a man Greek manuscript with that verse in it, I'll put it in my next edition. And so they produced a manuscript. In fact, they literally produced <laughs> a manuscript. <laughs> apparently what happened is somebody copied, out a copied it out in Greek, and when they got to this passage, they translated the Latin into Greek and put the verse in. And so Erasmus, who agreed to put it in his next edition, put it in his next edition, and so now the verse is in his, in his second edition. And that's the edition that's the basis for the King James translation. So that's why it made it into English. See, it's because, the, because of this, this deal with Erasmus. So the verse actually is not originally part of 1 John. It was added later. But if you read the King James Bible, you would think it was in there. OK, uh, a couple of other instances that are not as complicated. Uh, the woman taken in adultery. This is the famous passage in the Gospel of John where uh, Jesus is teaching in the temple and they drag this woman in front of him. The Jewish authorities drag this woman before him and they say she's been caught in the act of adultery and according to the law of Moses, she's to be stoned to death. What do you say we should do? Well, this is setting a trap for Jesus because if he says, well, yeah, stone her, <laughs> then he's breaking his own teachings about love and forgiveness and mercy. But if he says, no, let her go, then he's breaking the law of Moses. <laughs> so what's he supposed to do? Well, as you know, Jesus always has a way of getting out of these traps. 
And uh, this time what he does is he stoops down, he starts riding on, on the ground. He looks up and he says, let the one without sin among you be the first to cast a stone at her. Goes back down, starts riding on the ground again. And one by one, they start feeling guilty for their own sins and they leave until Jesus looks up again and there's just a woman there. And he says, is there no one here to condemn you? She says, no, Lord, no one. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. That's the end of the story. Terrific story. The favorite story, we know it's the favorite story because in every movie produced in Hollywood, <laughs> you've got to have this story if it's a, even Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. Even though that's about Jesus' last hour on earth, he has to have a flashback when he remembers the story because you've got to have the story if it's a Jesus movie. So it's in all... The problem is, this story was not originally in the New Testament. It's now found in John chapter 7 and 8, but in fact, it's not in our ancient manuscripts. It was only in the later manuscripts that it was found, and so it made it into the King James Bible, so it came into English, so everybody knows the story, but it's not original to the New Testament. It was added by a later scribe. That's the problem. Final, uh, last 12 verses of Mark. Mark is my favorite gospel because... There are lots of reasons. The ending is quite stark. Jesus has been crucified. They, uh, he's buried by Joseph of Arimathea. On the third day, the women go to the tomb, and it's empty. Jesus isn't in the tomb, but there's a man there who tells them that Jesus has been raised. And he, the man tells them, go tell the disciples that he will meet them in Galilee. And then the text says, the women said nothing to anyone. They fled from the tomb, for they were afraid. And that's it. That's the end. They didn't tell anyone. And Jesus didn't show up to anybody. That's it. It's, you know, it's over. So when you read this, you read it, you say, ay, 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 how can it end there? <laughs> didn't, didn't Jesus show up? Didn't, didn't they go tell the disciples? Well, scribes in the Middle Ages had exactly the same reaction. They copied the Gospel of Mark. They got to the end of it, and it says, the women fled from the tomb, didn't say anything to anyone, for they were afraid. And the scribes said, aye, aye, aye. It can't end there. And so they added 12 verses, in which the women go tell the disciples. The disciples go to Galilee. Jesus talks with them there in Galilee, appears to them. And so you have a nice rounded ending. It ends then. Well... That ending was not originally in the Gospel of Mark. It was added by later scribes. But the King James translators didn't know that. And so in your King James Bible, you'll have those last 12 verses. But in modern translation, uh, most modern translations either won't include it or they'll put it in brackets and tell you that it's not original, but it was added later. Okay, well, so if you want to know what Mark, how Mark ended his Gospel, it rather matters. Uh, and so the King James doesn't give you that information. Let me just say something very quickly about later revisions and editions of the King James Bible. People who think that the King James Bible is the only Bible there is don't realize that, in fact, there are lots of King James Bibles. The King James was revised in, uh, and still called the King James Bible. It was revised in 1613, where they made 413 changes. It was revised 150 years later in 1769, where they modernized the spelling language, modernized again in 1873, in 1982, the new King James Bible came out, where they got rid of all the these and thous, but left all the problems. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> the result is there are many thousands of differences among different King James Bible in spelling and punctuation, even though the wording has remained virtually intact, but the payoff is there's no one King James Bible. So if somebody says, you know, I just followed the King James Bible, you have to ask, well, which one do you follow? Because it's, there are different ones. There are some later revisions and additions that, uh, have, uh, that have struck modern readers as somewhat uh, humorous and interesting because of typographical mistakes in additions, some of which are in the exhibit over here. Uh, for example, the Unrighteous Bible, an edition done in 1653, 1 Corinthians 6.9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom? <laughs> well, that should encourage some activity. <laughs> The Sin On Bible of 1716, <laughs> where Jesus tells the woman caught in adultery, go and sin on more. <laughs> no more, it's on more. The Vinegar Bible of 1717, they had titles for the different passages. And in this one, 
for the instead of the parable of the vineyard is the parable <laughs> of the vinegar. <laughs> as far as you can get from the vineyard, but I don't think that's the point. Uh, the Lion's Bible of 1804, 1 Kings 8, 19, speaking to King David, the son that shall come forth from thy lions, uh, which is supposed to be loins. Uh, and then my favorite one, which is on display over here, uh, I didn't know it was going to be on display before I picked it. It's sometimes called the Wicked Bible, or I prefer calling it the Adulterous Bible of 1631. They left out the negative in the seventh commandment, and so it now says, thou shalt commit adultery. <laughs> This is the most popular Bible of all time. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, let me just uh, draw two very obvious conclusions. The King James is one of the worst study Bibles that you can go to. Uh, if you want to know what the authors of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, and the New Testament were trying to communicate, the King James is not a good study Bible. Uh, because of all the problems that, I, that I've laid out for you. At the same time, it is one of the greatest classics of English literature and should be celebrated because of that. It not only affected the English language with its resonances and its vocabulary and its phrases and its sentences, it actually is quite beautiful to read. And so uh, in some ways, it's, it's the worst Bible. In some ways, it's the best Bible. Thank you very much. <laughs>
uh, would use, they'd gather urine in vats and use it. And it's one of the reasons they require fullers to be outside of the limits of town, the outskirts of town, because you didn't want, because it's, you know, it's not, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. Um, so, one of the things, I'm certainly struck in the 21st century of, um, by the, the way that KGB uh, sounds, but in looking at the leaves, I'm also struck at how different it looks than from our Bibles. Um, two things that sort of strike me are the Roman letters that I see occasionally interspersed in the black letter, and I was wondering about those. Yeah. But I'm also wondering if you know, I, when, when you see pronouns in the KGB where the antecedent is, is God or Jesus, they're not capitalized. And we're sort of used to seeing yes. capital P's. And yes, that's when, a good point. When does that happen? Oh, that's a great question. He's asking, when, when did you start getting capitalization of pronouns for the deity, for God, and for Jesus? And I, I don't know the answer to this. Anybody know? I don't, I don't know. The other question is that you have these different typefaces. Every now and then you have a word that's in a different typeface. And that's still replicated in most King James Bibles today in a different way where they'll, uh, where they'll do it in italics. And what that is is for words that are not represented in the Greek or Hebrew, directly represented in the Greek or Hebrew, that they're supplying so the sentence makes sense. They'll put those in italics so you know that that's not in the original. And you know, part of the logic of that is that the original words is what really matters and you need to know what the original words are. And so they, they don't want you to think that their words they're supplying you know, are as inspired as the original words. Yeah. Yeah, but that does go all the way back to 16 of them. Yes. Thank you for your talk. I thought it was really interesting. Uh, I have two questions. One I think is really easy and straightforward, and the other one is slightly more complicated, perhaps. Um, the first one is, uh, you said that there were estimates of how much of Tyndale was in the in the King James, and I'm surprised that they still have to estimate. Hasn't anybody uploaded the two and done a kind of uh, uh, comparison between? Did, did you hear in the back? Uh, I I think <coughs> yeah. No, I understand what you're saying, and I don't know if anybody has done it. The the, the greatest biblical Tyndale scholar today says it's 92 percent, uh -huh. but he 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 did that calculation before he would have had a computer to do it. And I don't know if there's a straightforward way of counting, because in most cases, you know, there, there would be, you could just take word, but, but there, there, there might be like a different, um, like a different part of speech, but the same root word. And right. so, you know, do you count that or not? Well, it's like that turn it in program that you use for undergraduate papers. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever percentage. Yeah, yeah, right, 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 right. Right. The second question has to do with the ways in which, um, some language comes into later versions, later of the, of the manuscript versions, and you seem very confident that that means those are always added later, but given the presumably much larger number of these manuscripts that once existed that have never been discovered and don't survive, yeah. how do we know that yeah. Yeah. The, the things that we see in, in slightly later yeah. written versions are not also in yeah. earlier things that we just don't know about. Yeah, so this is, uh, when, Je when Jeff was introducing me and saying that I, I was trained as a textual critic, what, he's, what he was referring to is a shorthand way of saying that that's the kind of thing that, yeah. that I, my training is, that, that you, you have, a textual critic isn't somebody who just kind of analyzes the text, it's somebody who tries to reconstruct what the oldest form of the text was based on the surviving manuscripts. And so there, uh, it's a probability judgment. And so there's almost never any complete certainty. But in some cases, the probabilities are so high that you can really be fairly certain. Because these manuscripts that do survive, these, these 5,600 manuscripts we, we happen to survive, it's a random sample in some ways. Because it, you know, some of them just happen to show up. And so if you get a random sample of you know, for the, the book of First John, you know, if you get a random sample of 600 manuscripts and none of them before the 16th century have this passage, you know, so, so uh, you know, 596 of these are before the 16th century, none of them have a passage, but the only ones in the 16th century happen to have, then, you know, it's a probability judgment, but, so that's it's pretty probable. So the three examples I gave you are, uh, the one, the one about the, the Trinity, 
There's really no, nobody except for complete fundamentalists who have any questions about that. The woman taken in adultery isn't quite that high, but it's pretty high. And there are, there are a couple of people who still argue that those last 12 verses of Mark uh, really were original. But there are more problems than just the manuscripts. Uh, for one thing, another thing you do is you look at the vocabulary. And is the vocabulary consistent with the rest of the book? And you look at the writing style. Is the writing style consistent with the rest of the book? And so you do, you do lots of things. You don't just look at manuscripts. You actually look at other, other factors. And so then you end up making a probability judgment. Yes? First off, thank you very much. Um, my question is, you had mentioned that a lot of the, the ca some of the passages that were found in the Latin were not found in the Greek, and that it seemed that they were added things to the Latin. Yes. What, if it's possible to answer, what do you think is the reason they added it in yeah. if it was not even in the Greek in the first place? Yeah, yeah, okay. So her question is, that, so if you, get, if you get a verse that's in the Latin, but it's not in the Greek, how did it get in the Latin? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, so it's a great question. And so um, you also get instances in which you get Greek scribes adding things. So for example, the woman taken in adultery it probably got added in by Greek scribes before it got into the Latin. And what happens sometimes is, for example, with that passage, what some people think is that this is a story that everybody heard. The woman taken in adultery is a popular story about Jesus. And some scribe who's copying the Gospel of John at this point says, you know, this passage reminds me of that story that we all know, and he wrote it in the margin. And then the next scribe came along and said, oh, look, this guy left out the story and stuck it in the margin. I'm going to put it back in. So when he copies it, he copies it so that he puts the story in. And then the next guy copies that manuscript, and so it happens like that. So sometimes it happened also with the Latin manuscripts that somebody would, would be copying something, they'd add a verse from the margin, or they would just add something they thought should be there. And so it was in the Latin, but it never happened on the Greek side. <coughs> See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, one more question. In the back. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your time. Um, we talked a lot about things that were added in in later revisions. Were there yeah. ever any instances of things that were just left out because the scribes didn't agree with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the things that the scribes left out. Yeah, uh, absolutely there were. And <laughs> some, uh, some rather interesting instances. So, sometimes, sometimes scribes would leave things out because, by accident. Like they would copy a word, and then, so you, when you're copying a manuscript, it's a little bit tricky. Uh, for one thing, these people didn't have desks. And so they probably have a manuscript on their knee and another manuscript on the other knee, and they're just kind of... And so you're copying, you copy a word, you, you read the word, and then you copy the word, and then you look back where you, where you just were, and sometimes your eye would go to the wrong place. So you'd leave out a word, or a sentence, or a page. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that happened. Um, one of the ways it happens is um, that one of the more interesting ways is sometimes you'll have a passage where you have the same words within a verse. So like, um, whoever betrays me before people will be betrayed. Whoever, whoever, did, whoever confesses me before people will be confessed before uh, the Son of Man. Whoever denies me will be denied before the Son of Man. Okay? So uh, when you get before the Son of Man, before the Son of Man, the, Sometimes, when uh, in a manuscript, those words, the same words before the Son of Man, would, would come on su subsequent lines. And sometimes when a scribe would do it, he'd copy this line, but then his eyes would go back to this line and think that's the line he just copied. And so then he'd continue on with the next line, and he'd leave out the middle line. <coughs> so that, that is called, that, that has a technical name. So the idea of your eye skipping from one thing to another is called parablepsis. And lines ending the same way are co is called homo italiotan. <laughs> and so this kind of mistake is called parablepsis occasioned by homo italiotan. <laughs> <laughs> so, just, just like, so sometimes, <clears throat> sometimes those scribes leave things out on purpose because they didn't like what it said. So I'll give you an example of that. This, this is a probability judgment. I mean, pe people can debate this one. But... Um, there's much debated passage in the Gospel of Luke. It's a famous passage. It's when Jesus is being crucified, and uh, when they're nailing him to the cross, in Luke's Gospel, this is only Luke, it's not in Matthew, Mark, or John, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. Right? Very famous words. 
Some manuscripts don't have it. In fact, a lot of manuscripts don't have it. And some manuscripts do have it. And so either somebody put the words in or somebody took the words out, right? I mean, somebody changed the text. Somebody put it in or somebody took it out. And so which is it? Well, what probably the majority of scholars think is this. When the early church fathers talked about this verse, they thought that Jesus was praying not for the Romans who were crucifying him, but for the Jews who were responsible for his death. Moreover, these church fathers thought that God never did forgive the Jews for what they did. And if that's the case, then you can figure out whether somebody put the verse in or took it out. Probably somebody took it out because they don't want Jesus praying for forgiveness if God isn't going to forgive them. And they certainly don't want Jesus praying for forgiveness for these Jews for the rotten things they did. And so it's taken out because for anti-Jewish reasons. To oppose, so, so Jesus doesn't pray for forgiveness. So, so that's an example of some, it looks, like, it looks like it was intentional one way or the other. Somebody intentionally stuck it in or somebody intentionally took it out. But you can see why somebody might have taken it out. So, you know, or you could come up with an argument for putting it in. But either way, it, it does happen in answer to your question. Mark, tell them the uh, uh, Codex Vaticanus Hebrews. Okay, okay, yeah, so I'll end with this. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> so, uh, so um, on my wall at home, in my study, I've got a, uh, a, a, a photograph of a page from a fourth century manuscript called Codex Vaticanus. It's called Codex Vaticanus because this manuscript was discovered in the Vatican Library. Uh, it's a very uh, famous manuscript that is a very important manuscript, one of our best manuscripts of the New Testament. And in the, uh, this page, the picture of the page I have is the book of, uh, is, is from the uh, book of Hebrews in the New Testament. And in the margin, it, this manuscript has the, right, has the scribe writing in three columns on the page. So there are three columns on the page. Boom, boom, boom. And this is the beginning of the book of Hebrews. And in the middle, between the first and second columns, there's a, a handwritten note by a scribe. So when you look at this manuscript, about, I don't know, a fourth of the way down the page, there's, there's a word that's written that looks like it has an erasure underneath it, like somebody erased something and wrote over it. And so, uh, if you look closely, if you, if you, with a magnifying glass, you look at it and put it under ultraviolet light or whatever you do, you can actually figure out what happened. This passage of Hebrews 1 verse 3 says in almost all Bibles, says, Christ who bears all things by the word of his power. Now, in this manuscript, Codex Vaticanus, the scribe didn't write Christ bears all things. He originally wrote Christ manifests all things. By the, words of it, by the word of his power. Now, the words look kind of similar in Greek, pharon and phanaron. They look kind of similar. He wrote manifest instead of bears, which isn't found in any other manuscript. Some scribe came along and erased manifests and put in the word bears. So in other words, the, the scribe made it, said uh, manifest, and centuries later, a scribe reading this, and that's wrong, erased it and put in the right word. A few centuries later, another scribe came along and realized what his predecessor had done and erased bears and put back in manifest. <laughs> and in the margin, he wrote a little note in Greek. And the note says, fool and knave, leave the old reading. Don't change it. <laughs> so, so, I thought that's great. So I've got a picture of this thing on my wall. <laughs> Okay, so I love what I know you have only one person, but the Hebrew um, could be, uh, if you put a punctuation under the letters, then it may change the meaning of the word. Yeah. So that's where the difficulty for the translators came in from the lack of the punctuation. They could have interpreted this way. Oh, yeah, well, that, that would lead to problems with translation the translation in, 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 in the ancient world. But the modern translators are using pointed texts. Mm -hmm. They're using uh, Codex Leningradensis, which is pointed. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.